Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. Today I've got Preston Gillum on the program, and we're going to discuss one of his articles in his in his most recent book. Now, the article is The Discipline of Bible Study. Now, this article can be found in his new book, Rigorous Grace, and I'll provide the links below the video to all of these all, all of this information. But also, this article is in a blog post, and you can find that blog post at PrestonGillum.com. So, Preston, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Tony. It's great to be with you. Absolutely, as always. And... Um, so uh, talking about some of the things in this article, Preston, the, the, the discipline of Bible study, we've been over other disciplines um, and, and we've discovered that they're very helpful, very encouraging in the believer's life. Now, the discipline of Bible study in this article, you talk about how the, the Bible is the world's bestseller, <laughs> but you're probably not going to find that on Amazon's bestseller list. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's not a, a fair or level playing field, I guess, in a way, uh, Tony. The the Bible is always perennially is the best seller on any list, and not by just a little bit. It's the margins are huge, and so for uh, there to be uh, really any measuring stick at all, uh, everybody just kind of says, oh, yes, the Bible, (laughs) that's the bestseller. Now then, what's number one? And so all other books that are bestsellers are measured in the the millions of copies sold, while the Bible is measured in the billions of copies sold. (laughs) So it's, it's really quite the spread. Yeah, so it's it's uh, believe it or not, it's it's very popular. But it, and you talked about there's something spiritual behind this as well. Is there something? Do you think there's there's, there's something deeper than it's just uh, it, it it it's a good book com- containing different chapters and and different books? Is it just good reading, or is it something uh, deeper, or maybe spiritual, but behind the Bible being the bestseller? Sure, I, it's probably both. I guess. Uh, I mean. I believe that the Bible is uh, divinely inspired. I mean, it, I believe it was uh, written through the inspiration of of God in the hand of men uh, and women. But um, so, you know, maybe that gives it an unfair uh, advantage, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, but it's also just great literature. And there are, you know, millions and millions of people who read the Bible just because it's great, great literature. There's nothing else like it. Uh, even in, even when you compare it to other ancient texts, there's just, there's just nothing, nothing like it. So it's great literature. Uh, it's very unique in the way it's structured, but it also is inspired. So there is that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, speaking of the Bible and speaking of the church, um, the church today in, in 2022, specifically in the West, we, we seem irrelevant in society by and large. Do you think that the lack of Bible study or the discipline of Bible study has anything to do with our irrelevance in society? Well, yes and no. Uh, to, to mince words a little bit, I don't think there is a lack of Bible study per se, Um, I think there is a lack of taking the study that we do in the Bible and bringing it aboard in inside our inside our souls, inside our hearts, such that it then um, guides and uh, influences the way that we live life. And I think that's where the accusation of irrelevance comes in and where the sense of, well, I read the Bible, it's an interesting book or whatever, but it really doesn't have any uh, bearing on how I live my life. And therefore, uh, it's one thing, my life's another, and so it's irrelevant to that. So I think the uh, criticism that you mentioned, and it is... It is significant that that faith, the church, the Bible, all of this is irrelevant uh, to life and and society. That that is the big criticism right now, and um, 
at face value, we have to look at that and say, well, you know, how, how can that be? I mean, the, the message of the church is the gospel and the Bible is the inspired word of God. How, how could that be irrelevant? And the answer is, well, it's not. The thing that's irrelevant is that I don't know what to do with it. And that believers don't know what to do with it. The church doesn't know what to do with it. Consequently, because we, the people of God, uh, don't know how to actually uh, implement and life out the message of the gospel and what we read in scripture, etc., then the message is deemed irrelevant to us as well as to the people uh, that know us. So the real question is, uh, yes, I, I need to learn how to study the Bible, and that's probably something that we should talk about a little bit, but not just study it for information. There is a, a live individual on the other side of that page, and he, God, wishes to speak to us and to guide us and to be part of everything, every aspect of our life, and to live his life through us. If all I do is read the Bible and gain information, I miss that. But if I read the Bible, take it aboard relationally such that I can live out of that relationship that the Bible superintends, now then, the Bible is relevant to every aspect of life. And uh, also in this article, you give some helpful hints on how to not only uh, not only to read the, the Bible and the scriptures, but how to apply it to our lives, questions that we ask ourselves while we're reading it. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. Okay. But uh, for someone out there who's not familiar with the scriptures, with the Bible, uh, the Bible is, is categorized into an Old Testament and a New Testament. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And not only that, but it's organized by themes as well. So uh, it doesn't read uh, like a normal like a normal book would read. So if you just open the Bible and start at page one, intending to read straight through to page 1450 or whatever, uh, you're going to bog down and, uh, and you're going to say, hey, this doesn't flow because it's not intended to be read that way. It's, it's organized thematically. And as you say, it is organized by an old part called the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and then a new part which is in the, the back of the Bible, uh, the New Testament or the, the New Covenant. And so what, what the Bible is really doing in its structure, if you will, is it, like all of history, is presenting what uh, the mind of God is doing, what life is like, etc., before the coming of Christ, and then after the coming of Christ. So just as history is organized uh, B.C. and A.D. or B.C.E. and C.E. as, there, as people are wanting to, to categorize it now. Um, and, the, and the line of demarcation is the, the birth of Jesus. The Bible's organized the same way with the Old Testament being the uh, before Christ comes and, and all of the Old Testament is actually pointing toward the coming of Christ. And then the coming of Christ is um, laid out in the first four books of the of the New Testament. So those first four writers give a a different view, uh, if you will, a, a different focus for the coming of Christ and present him four different ways, if you will. And then following those four books, the remainder of the New Testament then is, okay, since Jesus Christ has come, now what? And what does life look like? What does, how does this dictate history and so on? So the New Testament then flows out from the, from the life of, of Christ. The, the themes, the, the, the thematic organization of the Bible is uh, simply that uh, the Bible is organized by uh, history and uh, books of poetry and major prophets and minor prophets and letters and gospels and, and so forth. And so anyway, I think when a person sits down to read the Bible, like I said, to start at page one and, and read straight through, 
is really uh, uh, fairly challenging. I've, I've done that personally uh, in my ignorance uh, some years ago, and it was a slog for a while. <laughs> so, so anyway, there are all kinds of great resources online today that help you read through the Bible, if you will. And uh, one of those is uh, uversion.com, for example. And uversion.com will offer a number of different kinds of reading plans so that in the course of a year, you will have read the entirety of the Bible. You just won't have read it start to finish. Yeah, and we'll provide all of those links below the video for those study guides and how to study the scripture as well, as well as the links to your article. But in this article, Preston, you talked about uh, the Old and the New Testament is all about one person. Mm -hmm. Who is that one person? The one person is Jesus Christ. He is like the scarlet thread that be that runs throughout the entirety of the Bible, all the way from page one through the maps at the back of the Bible. He is the 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 single thread that ties all of that together in all of these different ways that we were just talking about. Uh, he is featured uh, sometimes at face value and at other times with all of the various types of, of literature that you can name. Everything from metaphor and analogy to allegory to uh, myth, uh, etc. All of these great literary devices are used in order to point to the actual person, uh, historical person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and you look at the Old Testament, for example, in Isaiah chapter 53, which was written hundreds of years before Christ Jesus came on the scene. And it's 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 a graphically de detailed illustration of the crucifixion of Jesus mm -hmm. and all of these Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled perfectly in, in graphic detail. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was listening to a mathematician one time and, and he said the odds of that happening to any one individual we're astronomical. Uh, yeah. You can't even, our, our minds can't even function that high to, to understand. So, mm -hmm. or to understand those, ma those mathematic uh, equations. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's all about Jesus. Now, uh, Preston, you talked about the, the, the Bible's broken up really into themes, poetry, prophecy, and letters. Um, for those new to the Bible, uh, the first step to study the Bible, and you talked about it, it probably shouldn't be from the beginning. But if you were encouraging one, someone who's never gotten into the scriptures before, is there a specific book that you would encourage them to go to first? Sure, um, I think so. I would encourage uh, a new reader to start with the New Testament book of John uh, or Mark, uh, either one, and uh, begin there. And you can find that listed in the table of contents. So the Bible has a, a table of contents, just like any other a chapter book has. And so you can find the, the Gospel of John or just the letter of John in the table of contents. And I would begin there. And the reason that I say that is because uh, John is a good writer. And so the book is uh, compelling in the way that it actually is structured and, and written. Uh, and it's a straightforward presentation of, of who Jesus is. And so there's a mix of Old Testament quotation and what that means, why it's there, and New Testament implication, if you will, and so forth. And so you get a good overview of who Jesus Christ is, why he mattered, why his life was influential, etc. And uh, you get it in, a, in an approachable sized book and something in a book that's well done and, and well written. So anyway, that's that's where I would uh, encourage you to begin. And then after you've read that, if you'd like to keep reading, then I would go over maybe to like the book of Ephesians, which is still in the New Testament. Again, you can find it in the table of contents. And the reason I say that is because the book of Ephesians will talk about the, the actual uh, result of Jesus' life. So for the person who becomes a believer in Jesus Christ and takes him into their, into their life as their uh, Lord and as their, as their Savior and so forth, um, 
Ephesians will talk then about what that means and how that should uh, influence life. Now we're back to the whole question of relevancy. And, you know, is Jesus Christ relevant? Yes, he's relevant. And here's how he's relevant in the way that I live my life and his impact upon my life. And, you know, for, for those that are, again, maybe new to the scriptures and they look at they go to the bookstore and they look for Bibles and a lot of these Bibles have commentaries. Um, talk to us a little bit. And you, you discuss this, I think, in your article about um, how there maybe there's a temptation to the, in, the the answer to the questions that I have in scripture are to be found in the commentary below. Yeah. Now. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Are commentaries good or can they be bad? Or what attitude should we have toward commentaries in our Bibles? Sure. So backing up a step. So a person goes to uh, the bookstore or goes to Amazon or whatever. The first thing they're going to see is that there are, it's just almost a vast array of Bibles in every color and form that you can imagine. And it's somewhat overwhelming. And uh, so uh, the Bible, obviously, uh, is ancient literature. It's not, you know, its original language is not English. And so every Bible that you see listed at Amazon.com or in a bookstore, if you go there or whatever, is a translation. And all translations are not equal. So uh, I would strongly encourage a person to pick up a translation of the Bible called the English Standard Version or the New American Standard Version. Uh, there's also a colloquial translation of the Bible called the Message. So all of those would be good uh, translations for you to begin reading. Some of those uh, translation. Some of those Bibles will have uh, commentary, as you say, uh, Tony, uh, or they'll be called study Bibles, something like that. And they'll have study tools and commentary inside them. And there is a distinction to be made between tools and commentary. Tools are things that help you do your own study. So uh, these are things that will, these are tools, resources that will help you find what you're looking for or to do some sort of a thematic study or something like this. You can also do this online at a place like BibleGateway.com, for example. And Bible Gateway has a strong search feature uh, with it. And so you can go there and type in anything from a word to a phrase. And Bible Gateway then will return uh, the result to you in the translation that you wish to study out of to you. And so it's a great resource to help you uh, find what you're looking for, to study what you're looking for, etc. Then commentary is somebody else's work that has done study in the Bible and gone to the trouble then to write this down. And if you buy a study Bible and there are, there's commentary with that, then, then some portion of that information will be from the primary editor or the primary contributor to that Bible. And there's nothing wrong with this, per se, provided it's a, a good solid uh, source like Ryrie, for example, uh, or somebody like that. And um, so there's nothing wrong with commentary, except that uh, you're letting somebody else do your reading for you and your interpretation for you. One of the great um, principles, one of the great truths of Scripture is that when a person becomes a believer, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of us. And so God is indwelling us. And you say, well, why? I mean, what's he there for? Well, he's there for a lot of reasons. But one of the primary reasons is that he guides our understanding when we look at the Bible and when we pray and so forth. It it, uh, he's there to come alongside us and help us understand who God is and why God is engaging with us and what our relationship is with him and so forth, whether we're praying or reading the Bible or listening to a teacher or whatever. So 
The privilege is that through the work of Jesus Christ, we are brought close to God, close in a familial way. We're, we're included in the life of God himself, and he wishes to communicate with us. So take him at his word, literally and figuratively, when you sit down to read the Bible and pray. And I, I, I pray like this when I start to read the Bible. I say, Lord God, I'm here to read your book. Would you speak to me out of it, please? And I believe then that the indwelling presence of God will guide and honor that prayer and guide me in my understanding and so forth. And that's really good. And then I'll, I'll take some notes, uh, maybe, if I if I see something or something I want to follow up on. I'll take notes about that and, and so forth and dig deeper when I have more time, et cetera, et cetera. And That's the first way to approach the Bible, a primary way to approach the Bible. After I have done my study, taken advantage of the tools that are at my disposal, then I can go to commentary and say, okay, what did Charles Ryrie say about this? Or what did John MacArthur say about this? Or whoever, Chuck Swindoll or Matthew Henry. I mean, there are tons and tons and tons of common commentators. And you can find uh, those people uh, at BibleGateway.com, Blue Line Bible or Blue Letter Bible. I don't remember which of those it is. There's all kinds of good resources uh, like that that will enhance then your own study. Yeah, and I noticed that for some reason you left uh, Joel Osteen out of that conversation, but let's move on. Preston, you you give some helpful uh, helpful tips, I believe, on how to study the scripture and how to personalize the scripture to yourself. So, and and four of those questions that you have to ask ourselves when we're, when we're reading scripture, I think, are very helpful. Let me just read them quickly. Number one, what is the scripture saying? Number two, what is God telling me about Himself in this passage? Number three, what does the passage say about me? And then number four. What do I then do with this passage? And you gave an example of uh, John chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. And if it's it's good with you, I'll just read through these verses. And we'll ask those questions. I'll ask you those questions uh, one by one. But let's, let's dig into this passage. This is very helpful. John 18, 1 through 3. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met him there with his disciples, or met there with the disciples. Verse 3, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So let's use this as, as an example, as you did in your article. So let's ask the first question, Preston. And the first question is, what is the scripture saying? Yeah, so this this question is simply asking, do I comprehend what I have read? In other words, do I understand it? And, um, you know, the answer can be everything from yes to uh, absolutely not to some of it or whatever. And so... Um, reading is all about comprehending what I read. And I, so it's not reasonable that I can do anything with it unless I understand it uh, to begin with. So this is where um, you say, well, I understand some of this. I mean, I, I realize that Jesus went from one place uh, to another. I don't really know you know, what that means in terms of location, you know, and geography. And there's some concepts in this that I really don't know anything about. Like, I don't know anything about the Kidron Valley. But I don't know what it means that Judas received uh, the Roman cohort, for example. And uh, those would be things that you'd say, okay, I need to figure that out before I go on here because I, I need to understand. I need to comprehend what I am reading. So what's this saying to me? So this is where you'd go to your to your tools. And uh, for example, the the Kidron Ravine or the Ravine of the Kidron, you could go, uh, if you have kind of a normal kind of a Bible on hand, most Bibles have, uh, you know, anywhere from three or four to eight or 10 maps in the back of them. And so you can go 
back there and find a map of the city of Jerusalem and locate the Valley of the Kidron, and you'd be able to see, oh, Jesus left here. He walked down through this ravine and up the hill to the Garden of Gethsemane. Or you could do an online search and just, you know, go to the search bar um, and type in, where is the Valley of the Kidron? And, of course, you'll get, you know, 40,000 returns, if you will. And so you just read until your heart's content that you understand where that is and why it is influential and so forth. The same with an idea like uh, a cohort. What is that? And so you say, what is a Roman cohort? And you'll find a return there. And, and this, is, this is a good illustration as to why doing this kind of work matters. What you'll read uh, when you type in the word for what's a Roman cohort, you'll find out there that Judas showed up here in the garden with, you know, somewhere between 500 and 700 fully armed troops, (laughs) Roman soldiers, Uh, in addition then to uh, the... Uh, the troops, the, the militia that were part of the the, the Jewish uh, uh, population here, the the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the Jewish leaders. So there's you know seven or seven hundred or so armed people that show up here uh, when Jesus is in the garden, and so all of a sudden you say, okay. Uh, Jesus and his disciples had dinner. Uh, Judas was a, a mole. You know, he, he was betraying Jesus, so he leaves. So there's all this subterfuge in there. And uh, he goes out and cuts this deal. Jesus, meanwhile, and his, uh, you know, the 11 guys left, they go through this valley and climb up to this park-like garden and he's praying there. So there's 11 guys sleeping. Jesus is off praying. And all of a sudden, you know, here comes all this noise. And there's, you know, 700 armed troops that have come to uh, arrest Jesus. This is a, an incredible scene that gets laid out by simply asking the question, do I comprehend what I'm reading? Yeah, and that's a lot of information that <clears throat> I think we need to dig into. And, and, and just on the outset here, listening to you uh, discuss this, Preston, it seems like it's hard to be in a rush to, to properly do, do Bible study or, or study the Bible on your own. It seems like, and, and a lot of, and I, I could be wrong here, but a lot of uh, formats and, and yearly Bibles I, that I've experienced, and this is just me, maybe maybe because I'm a slow reader, it's hard to really dig into the Scriptures when I'm trying to get through the Bible, maybe in a certain period of time. Do you, do you see that or am I way off yeah, base? No, I think you're exactly right, Tony. I mean, um, <laughs> this is probably one of the things that makes the Bible such a uh, an amazing book and a great seller every year. <laughs> you can read the Bible for volume, and that's what, you know, reading through the Bible in a year would uh would be about. And so, you know, you'll spend, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, maybe, I don't know, uh, each morning reading uh, a lot of information. Uh, and uh, so that you can get get through the Bible. So, yeah, you can read the Bible just for broad content. And that's perfectly fine. And everyone ought to do that on some sort of a of a regular basis. But then you can also read uh, the Bible inside one of the books, like I uh, recommended earlier with the book of of John. You can also read um, uh, just passages of Scripture, and then you can read a paragraph of Scripture uh, there's a, you can do a uh, Bible study with a phrase of scripture, or like I just suggested there with the word cohort, you can read the Bible and do a word study on the Bible. The Bible is such an amazing book that you can devote yourself to that type of reading and examination and study for the duration of your life and never find the end of the book. And yet the message of the Bible is, 
is simple enough, it claims, that even a child can understand uh, why Jesus came and the magnificence of who he is in his coming. Yeah, and, uh, you know, for example, I was going through the scriptures this morning in the book of Psalms, and there was one verse, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, it's God is merciful and, he, and he's slow to anger. And I was reading through that, and I, I, I had to go back to that. I, I, I was thinking to myself, I need to think on this for a while. I yeah. need to think how, it, you know, all of these all of these steps that you have here, I need to see how it applies to my life. First of all, you know, God is merciful. He's slow to anger. How, how does that reflect in our world today? How does it how does it affect me? And I, I was just kind of overwhelmed. And it's not something I, I couldn't go on to the next verse. I had to I had to camp there for a while. So yeah. I can see where we need to camp out many times at a, a phrase or a, a word or um, we need to stay there for a while and let God tell us what what the uh, what the meaning is. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first question, you know, what's this saying is profound. I mean, God is merciful and slow to anger. Uh, that's, you know, do I do I comprehend what that's telling me? Well, I mean, I understand the words, but the concept of that is quite, quite remarkable. And so I need to think about that for a while. Yeah. And uh, it's it's, uh, you know, it's it's such, you know, that that one verse there. We'll get back to the verses in John, but uh, it's so refreshing and so life giving, you know, when I read over those scriptures like that. So the second question you've got, Preston, and again, we're talking about John 18, 1 through 3, about Jesus getting ready to be betrayed here. Uh, what is God telling me about himself in this passage? Yeah, so um, now that I have comprehended what the, what the situation is, what the, what the Bible's telling me, and uh, the setting, then I can say, well, Okay, so who is Jesus Christ then? Uh, and that's, you know, for for uh, for the authorities to feel like they needed, you know, seven hundred armed guys to come to arrest him. Uh, what's that telling me about Jesus Christ? Uh, it's telling me uh, that he was perceived as really powerful. Uh, really influential, that he was uh, uh, important, and that he's uh, uh, intimidating, maybe even. I mean, there's all kinds of implications that I could uh, draw here. And uh, probably the only wrong answer is that he's weak. Uh, you know, if he was weak or a nobody, then uh, you know, the five, the five to 700 guys with swords and shields and so on wouldn't make any sense. And so it's telling me that Jesus Christ is unlike any other, any other human being that's ever lived. Uh, I mean, there's pro I don't, I personally am not familiar with a story where, you know, five to 700 armed people come to arrest one person. Now, I mean, there's stories of, you know, hundreds out looking for one person, like back during the Iraqi war, there were probably thousands of people looking for Saddam Hussein, for example, or um, during the Afghanistan campaign, there were thousands of people looking for Osama bin Laden. Um, but when it came time to arrest him, uh, there were, you know, a dozen or so and so forth. So the story here about Jesus and his arrest is unlike any other story in any other piece of literature. It's, it's quite amazing. So it's telling me that he is really important, really powerful, really strong, etc. Absolutely. And let's go on to the next helpful question that you have uh, to ask ourselves. And the third question is, what does this passage say about me? So I'm not actually in the passage, obviously, neither are you. Um, but the balance of Scripture tells us that when we become a believer, that uh, a couple of things happen. One, that I 
come to live inside of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ lives inside of me. So I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. These are uh, two uh, perspectives that run throughout the uh, entirety of the New Testament. And so I say, how does this passage apply to me? Well, it tells me that this individual, Jesus Christ, who is so powerful and so strong and so influential, lives in me and wants to live through me. And the confidence that he exhibits and the composure that he exhibits, I live in him. And so that composure and that confidence are mine as uh, one who identifies as being in Jesus Christ. That strength, that uh, that importance, that uh, ability to represent God is, you know, Jesus is living in me and wants to live through me. So all of that, then, as I look at how he handles himself, I say, OK, I don't have, you know, 700 armed guys coming to to get me today, per se, but I. I do feel that, you know, life is a bump and a grind and there are issues and tensions and I feel stress, etc. And all of those things were present that night in the garden. And so the Jesus that is in that garden is in me today in my life and he wishes to live through me and he's given me uh, a sense of of identity and presence of being in him. And so that guides how I then can live my life today and deal with my kids and my wife or my job or whatever the issues are, or this heartbreak or this celebration or this opportunity or this disappointment. It's a, it guides then how Jesus will live uh, through me and in me today. Absolutely. So we've asked the questions, uh, number three of them. Uh, number one, what is the scripture saying? Number two, what is God telling me about himself in this passage? And number three was, what does this passage say about me? Now, the last question that you have uh, as an encouragement is, what do I then do with this passage, Preston? Yeah. And so I think then, uh, like I was just saying, okay, this is... Um, who Jesus is in me, um, and as I as I comprehend that, then I say, okay, and I pray again and say, dear Lord Jesus, would you live your life through me today, as I uh, go to this board meeting, or as I have this difficult customer, or I've got to go handle whatever, you know, go meet, go meet the teacher or whatever it is that you're doing today. Um, that, that then um, invites uh, requests that God live his life through Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit in me, invites him to be real and present as I uh, head out for the for the day or as I take on whatever. And so then I say, amen. I close my Bible. I get up from my reading, believing this is what the Bible calls faith, believing that God will take me at the word of my prayer and my request and he will do as I ask. And I walk then out the door or whatever in that confidence and that now makes my faith relevant. I'm informed about what my faith is. I'm, ref I'm informed and understand who my faith is in, Jesus Christ. I understand why this matters to me, and I understand how to implement. Now then, my Bible study has become something that is relevant to my life, and I actually can live out of the, the Word of Scripture to me. Yeah, and it's all about not only understanding it, but then living it out. And uh, the, the hope, the inspiration, the life-giving uh, power that we receive from uh, Christ in us as, as mm. believers uh, my gosh, Preston, in, in our day and age, we certainly need that, don't we? Oh, boy, don't we ever, Tony. Don't we ever. 
So, Preston, uh, all of this information, this article can be found in your new book, Rigorous Grace. Yeah. And I'll, I'll provide the links below the video. Also, uh, the blog article at PrestonGillum.com. I encourage you to check it out. I'll provide that link as well. Preston, is there anything you want to add to uh, the discipline of Bible study? No, I don't think so, Tony. I, th- I think it's been a great discussion. You've done a, a great job of, of guiding us, I believe. The the only thing that remains is to begin, uh, you know, to start. And lots of people, you know, get up 15 minutes early uh, in order to find some quiet time before the household is up and, and you know, thriving and, and churning and whatnot. Uh, some quiet time just to spend in the in the scripture, and uh, I would encourage you just just get started. As uh, a guy that I follow at Instagram, Jaco Willing, as he says, just do it and uh, go after it. And, you know, go get it, and that's very true. Just begin to sit down with the scripture. And uh, one of the things that the Bible says is that it will not render, reading it will not render a null uh, product. In other words, it will always uh, speak to us in, in some fashion uh, along the lines of, of those four questions. So what I learned there, Preston, is we need to fight for that quiet time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Well, uh, Preston Gillum, uh, and again, the article is The Discipline of Bible Study. And Preston, thank you so much for joining us today. Donnie, it's always my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And until next time.